It's bold prediction season on Locked On Twins, and tonight we're going to get Dave's five bold predictions for this season. We'll talk a little bit more about the fallout with Shohei Otani and whatever else comes to mind. This is Locked On Twins. You are Locked On Twins. Your daily Minnesota Twins podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello again and welcome back to Locked On Twins. I'm your host Brandon Warren and you can unfollow me on the tweets at Brandon underscore W-A-R-N-E. And joining me, we'll be doing a draft here in about an hour for fan graphs, is Mr. Dave Brown at Answer Dave Brown on the tweets. What's up? You don't mean a draft like a beer. You mean we're going to pick players for our fantasy team. I I always used to tell Eno Saris that Rule 5 Draft, D-R-A-U-G-H-T, would be kind of a cool name for a beer. But I don't know if it would be like if you use really young wheat or barley. I, I don't know. Like, you know, something that's not. <laughs> I, I don't know what the ins and outs of beat rows. Yeah. Ooh. I can't believe he didn't steal that idea. That's a really good idea. Yeah, so I don't know. It, it is an interesting idea. But thanks for making Locked On Twins your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on YouTube and, of course, as part of the Locked On Podcast Network for your team every day. Today's episode brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. Go to prizepicks.com slash Locked On MLB and use the code Locked On MLB, all lowercase, for a first deposit match up to a hundred bucks. Also, are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? If you have to turn down the volume with all that shouting, you should make the switch to Locked On Sports today. It's a free 24-7 streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Dave, Twins fall 4 nothing to the Braves, 8-19 and in spring training, 1-14 and away from Fort Myers, or at least away from, gosh, what do they call it now? I, I uh, Hammond State is what I want to keep calling it, but 8-19, um, I think Scott Erickson was 8-19 and back in like 1993, so nice, uh, nice nod to him, if I'm not mistaken. Did he really lose 19 games? Let's look on the Twitter machine. And so Twins victimized by the long ball, uh, all four runs scoring. Um, sorry, no, not all four. Uh, Marcel Ozuna hitting a three. No, you're, you're right. Three run. I'm right. Three run homer. Austin Riley hitting a solo. Both off Bailey Ober finishes spring training with a 5.65 five ERA, 22 strikeouts, and just five walks. So some pros and some cons. Back to Scott Erickson. He did. he did? He did. He lost 19 games in 93. Boy, Two my years mind, after winning 20. My mind is like a steel trap, isn't it? I knew that. And he didn't even, you know, his uh, his FIP wasn't even that bad. So I, I haven't looked at – I haven't really broken down Scott Erickson's career lately. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think he deserved to lose 19 games. I think I, – I know 93, that was a bad Twins team. I, I wasn't can recall supposed to be Frank Thomas hitting one about 600 feet off Eddie Gardado. Yeah, it wasn't supposed to be a bad team. I think they were supposed to be decent because in 92, they were actually fairly good. And then 93, you know, they brought in Dave Winfield. And you're thinking Winfield, Puckett, Herbeck should be a fairly respectable middle of the order. Shane Max, a good player, so on and so forth. It didn't pan out. But that's the first year I started watching the Twins. So I do have a pretty good memory of that whole season. Um, yeah, so not not too much to get excited about. The bullpen usage, uh, Daniel Duarte, Josh Stelmont, and Matt Bowman each pitch an inning. Actually, Duarte is an inning in two-thirds after Ober went four and a third. If, am, I, am I wrong to say that maybe we have not given enough love to Matt Bowman for a bullpen spot? I mean, he's got big league experience. I haven't given any love to him. So uh, I, if he gets one, yes, we did not give, enough, give him enough love. I was uh, – I've not been expecting him to make the team, but right. uh, that that would be you no. Know, that's my own issue. I need to do better if it turns out that he does. 
Manuel Margot is hitting, this is an incredible slash line, 091, 087, 091. So not only does he have no extra base hits, but he also has a sacrifice in there or an out that did not count on his OBP, but did count on his average. He's got that rarely seen average is higher than the on-base percentage. And guess what, Dave? I'm calling it right now. He's going to homer off Cole Raggins on opening day. Wow, that's a big, that's a bold prediction, if you will. I kind of like it. That's a long way to left field, though, and uh, he's going to have to hug the line at uh, Kauffman Stadium because, uh, you know, getting it up into the fountains, that's going to be difficult. But we'll we'll see aesthetically what this looks like. But you put yeah. it out there. It's predicted. In Castellano's corner over there. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, Josh Stelmont, though, one strikeout, one hit in his inning. You know, it basically seems like a foregone conclusion that he's in the bullpen or really more or less is. Duarte, I read, has been told to prepare to go to St. Paul, but be ready if the Twins call on him early. Um, you know, again, that might matter, too, with the Stalmont situation. Didn't he have an, an uncomfortable slip or something like that? that he was did. He had something described as an uncomfortable slip by Rocco and uh, kind of worried that I – what I was stuck on that. I don't even know what he yeah. jacked up apparently, but he said, it's all right. I'm not going to let, I'm not going to wear this uncomfortable slip for very long. I'm taking it off. I'm going to go without, I'm going to have a petticoat. And sounds, sounds like the time that I was on the elevator with Rocco Baldelli, who was at the time coaching for the Rays. I think he was their first base coach and we're riding the elevator together. So I didn't even know who he was. Like I obviously knew what he looked like from when he played for the Rays. But I peek down and he's got luggage and the luggage tag that says Rocco Baldelli, Tampa Bay Rays. And I'm like, whoa, you're Rocco Baldelli. And like, it just came out of my mouth. And he goes, yep. And smiles. And then I go, man, I'm sorry for how your career went. And then I'm like, oh. how your career went? Yeah, like how it went. And then I'm like, oh, no. And he goes, he smiles and he goes, me too. And he was just very gracious about it. He could not have been more gracious. And then he gets hired as the Twins manager like two years later, and I walk up to him, and I'm like, do you remember that? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. Like, it's not Lance Lynn bad. You know the Lance Lynn story, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. not allowed to see my kids. Yeah. So I don't know if you'd give it, like, I think the Lance Lynn story is like three Rocco Baldelli's worth of embarrassment. But Rocco left it off, and he's a super guy, and, you know, it's uh, it's it's – you Something did come. Like you did come off as very uh, Chris Farley like. Yep, that's exactly that's, this incident. That's the exact thing that I gift when I told that story the most recent time. I think it was the time he was talking to Paul McCartney. Yeah, because I think he talks to Paul hey, McCartney and Jeff. You remember Bridges. when you had that uh, mitochondrial disorder mm -hmm. and you couldn't play anymore? Did that and suck? You were, and you were a Red Sox for like a half an hour. That was awesome, except it was the opposite of awesome. Rocco Baldelli's hometown. Woonsocket. Woonsocket. It's you gotta say it right. You gotta say Woonsocket Woon like you're from there. I actually stumbled upon a video of his brother Dante, who actually follows me on the X, the tweets. Um, he God. had to kind of follow in Rocco's footsteps. He's quite a bit younger, but about the expectations put on him after being Rocco Baldelli's, but I mean, he's still Rocco Baldelli's brother, but in high school coming so. up moon socket, you know, he's, you got to got your brothers drafted, what, like fourth overall. And uh, that's a pretty tough, um, pretty tough set of shoes. to. God fill. bless their mom and dad for absolutely. I don't know if they're named after a family members, but leaning into uh, their Italianosity with the Rocco hey. and the Dante. Hey. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I said, you know uh, like names, huh? you know, like your names, you know, that, for you? that AOC meme where she's doing that and everybody used it. Yeah. And I said, that's what Aaron Boone looks like when he's calling for Ron Marinaccio out of the bullpen. <laughs> it's, hey, give me, bring me Ronnie. Um, do you, do you remember Ozzy Guillen, uh, doing the, the hand signals for Bobby Jenks and he kind of makes a, like a fat guy. Yeah. Same kind Probably of a lot funnier in that era than it would be now, but um, oh, it, I can, well, yeah, you know, it's I uh, can respect another the time. Era that it took place, and it was a yeah, a um, a product of the times, yeah. Uh, so yeah, twins give up homers to Austin Riley, and I oh, yeah, said, the twins. Oh, I almost I yeah, I almost said Pablo Ozuna, I'm showing my age here, but oh. uh, Marcel Ozuna, that's so, so 2005, yeah. 
Right. Yeah. Not a lot of shame there. Uh, was he an expansion draft player at one point? I, I don't know. I, we, we don't have to go down that path, but. Oh, we don't want to go down that path. My first thought is no, I don't but, think so, but I don't know. We had an episode with Buck Showalter where we oh, got we're to going ask down a path. Yeah. A bunch of expansion draft questions. And the whole thing was like, he said he would never, ever want to start a franchise again. Cause it sucks so much to do all that. <laughs> but um, sounds like a fantasy draft. Yeah, except much harder. Anyway, let's take a quick pause, give some love to prize picks when we come back. We've got Dave's top five bold predictions and then a little bit of Otani talk to top it off. But again, first, prize picks. And your friends at Prize Picks want you to know that they are the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS because it's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players who might be doing some nefarious things like entering 80 different lineups or doing other things that aren't allowed, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch your winnings roll in. Do you want to play the demons or the goblins? which sounds like you're playing a Halloween game with your friends outside. But really, demons are demon picks marked in red, and they're scarier because they're a little bit more risky. But you can win big money, like 100 times your money if you go really, really deep there. That's 10 bucks to bet to win 1000 So, again, you take some risk, but you rake in the winnings if you are correct. But if you're more conservative and cautious, you can always go with a goblin pick. Those are marked in green because they're keeping you in the green because they're a little easier to stack and get consistent victories. So payout is less than a demon pick, but again, keeping your winning streak going, much better odds. So if you're into the NBA, which is winding down, you can pick more than or less than three-pointers, turnovers committed, all that fun stuff. Or for spring training baseball, which is coming to an end, you can pick more than or less than on pitcher strikeouts, first inning runs, anything you can imagine. So download the Prize Picks app today. And enter the code locked on MLB all lowercase for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. Again, that's code locked on MLB all one word lowercase and get that first deposit match up to 100 bucks. Join prize picks today. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, Dave, we got to plow through these top five or your five bold predictions because I get a feeling that our third segment is going to be a pretty spirited one as well. So your first one is, uh, you know, I'll put it up the screen and you can read it. So Dave. Oh, it's on the board. Look at that. You can put it on the it, board. Yes. Yes. Um, well, I'm, I've, I've stumped my, or not stumped. I've uh, scooped myself. Mm -hmm. I stump myself all the time, but it says my first bold prediction for the 2024 season is the twins will win 98 games and finish the season 12 and a half games ahead of the Tigers in the AL Central. Don't ask me about how the half game. I just added that for color. I don't know. There's a rain out somewhere and they don't get me. Oh, they yeah, yeah. Out. I didn't even think of that. Um, that's a good point. Anyway, uh, 98 wins. So obviously bold, which is the name of the game with bold predictions. But I like it because, again, we're seeing the Twins depth already being put into motion. I don't necessarily want to say tested because they're, they're, they're in a spot that they had an, at least somewhat anticipated and are – appearing likely to be able to weather that storm at least as much as you can plan for that sort of thing 98 wins obviously ambitious but the white Sox are bad the royals aren't going to be very good the tigers and guardians are anywhere from that 70 to 84 win ether so we'll see what happens and you know they're still going to get to play uh the angels who probably won't be very good the a's who are going to be absolute dog water and then you know some uh, interleague games that'll be not as hard to. I, I like it. I would, if I was to be aggressive, I'd probably say like 96, but what's two games among friends? Well, I'm more aggressive. And why would you feed your dog A's water? That's disgusting. Because it's all I can afford. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, I no, I like that pick. I like the idea that you think they're going to win the many. You know, you look at the projections, like baseball prospectus is Pakoda and Fangraphs. Uh, what does Fangraphs calls theirs? Uh, Ozzy Guillen, I think, if we're naming them after obscure utility infielders. No. No, theirs is named after Dan Pasqua. I call it Pasqua. It's, we're just going uh, all the way in on obscure guys. But Fangraphs and, and those projections kind of skew, like, even the really good teams, they only predict for, like, 92, 93, 94 wins. Unless you're, like, the 
the peak Dodgers where it, you'd nudge it over a hundred. So, well, they're aiming for the, the middle. I mean, this isn't so much of a, this is not a, an Al Gore rhythm. This is not a Dan Simborski uh, projection with science and math and all that stuff. This is uh, you know, a range of possibilities. This is, you know, most everything from this point going yeah. the twins way. And that's how you get 98 wins. And there's and, uh, you know, how else do they get there? We'll find out in these other bold predictions that follow. Yeah. Some- Aim for the middle. Sounds like me in high school. Number two, three Twins players will finish in the top 10 in AL MVP voting. I realized as I was saying and trilling three that I read it and you didn't. So I'm sorry, but defend your place or your position, sir. Um, three Twins players. Well, I'm not naming them necessarily, but you, I think one of them actually might be um, – Pablo Lopez. I think Pablo Lopez might finish that All high in, in the MVP voting. I want to put, uh, Car- I want to put, uh, I want to have Carlos Correa come all the way back. I'm just not sure if he's going to play enough games, if his uh, stats will be, you know, he's still probably going to be pacing himself. I'm, I think he's going to, he's going to want to have a better year than he did last year. He's healthier mm-hmm. in a position to do that. I'm not sure if he's going to finish in the, in the top 10, but uh, I'm thinking, Buxton, maybe Royce Lewis and and Pablo Lopez are the three guys. I, I like that you've taken the meatloaf approach where two out of three of the top position players ain't bad. So if one has any sort of hiccup, whether it's Carlos Correa and the ankle, or if it's Byron Buxton and anything else, or if it's Royce Lewis and anything else, you, you leave yourself a little bit of a little bit of leeway there, but no, I, I think three of the 10 could happen. I, I want to say 2006, the twins had, I don't know if they had three because 06 was the year Morneau won it. Maurer had a terrific year. He had like 347. And then Johan Santana won the Cy Young and should have won it three years in a row. I don't know if they're all top 10, but it's not impossible. So I, I suppose I could have gone back and looked that up. That would have been I'll, a good thing. I'm going to look it up while you're reading the next one. Your number three one is... Seven twins, seven, will make the AL All-Star team. And the list will include catcher Ryan Jeffers. And I should have put a period after Jeffers. Oh, I could have done that too. In, oh, wow. They did not have three twins in the top 10 that year. You they cut out there, uh, twins in the you top cut out there uh, Brandon. You did, did not have, oh, oh in 2006? They 20 out six. They did not have three in the top ten. They had three in the top seven. Mm. Well, that's that's even old. older than my prediction. So I'm uh, it makes me feel bad. I should have gone bolder. So Morneau, Justin Morneau, who won, had the lowest war of the top three and the second lowest war of the top eight. Thank you. Lower, first base defense deduction. Yep. Lower than Derek Jeter, lower than David Ortiz. He was higher than Frank Thomas, lower than Jermaine Dye, lower than teammate Joe Maurer, and Johan Santana, 7.6 baseball reference war that year. That's actually number one among all MVP voters' votes. Um, actually, surprisingly enough, if we rank them in order, they fit the, the top players by B war, baseball reference war, are they finished 7th, 11th, 22nd, 10th, and 26th. Something so tells seven, me. Something tells me we were not paying attention to war. The, the Johan, I'm going to read them because I'm sure people care. No. Johan finished seventh, Grady Sizemore 11th, Vernon Wells 22nd, Carlos Guillen 10th. And I guarantee you will not remember who finished 26th. It was a right handed pitcher from the AL East. Uh, well, it's not Jason Jennings, but I don't know. Who was it? Chin Min Wong. Oh, yeah, he's quite uh, Taiwan zone or Taipei, depending on yeah. the Chinese mainland. But he, yeah, he threw the heck out of the ball. Anyway, I love the Jeffers pick. And as much as I believe in Jeffers, I don't think catcher is all that deep. Like, it never really has been, you know, as far as there's always been like, oh, two or three guys we really like. Like, even in the Joe Mauer days, it was Joe Mauer, Russell Martin, and Brian McCann. Well, like, I now- think if you look at the, uh, from a fantasy baseball standpoint and look at projections on who's going to do what the, the numbers for lots of catchers are not that different. Uh, they're, they're kind of similar and uh, they're, they're better than they were 
it's deeper from a, you know, uh, it used to be that there were, a, like you said, a couple of good guys and then mm, not much. Yeah. But everybody except the White Sox has a pretty good catcher these days. Um, or two, it comes down to number of catchers playing too. Like absolutely. So I mean, Jeffrey has those two good catchers. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's going to take some doing, but, uh, I think Jeffers is in a, a really good position to, to, uh, to do that. He's going to have enough, uh, he's going to have enough rest time, I, I think, um, because they, they have a little depth of catcher, but he's going to put up some great numbers, his best numbers individually, I think. Uh, so far, that's going to take some luck and who knows, but I, I think he's going to have a great year. Many people have been saying that, trust me. So let's take a quick second. We'll give some love to FanDuel. We come back, we're going to get your last two picks, and then we've got some Shohei Otani talk. FanDuel says that you can say goodbye to busted brackets. Uh, now, believe it or not, I have all four of my final four teams still alive. So I can opt out of this entire thing. I'm just kidding. Uh, FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. So if you want to bet on a big upset, and we've seen a few of those, or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get 200 bucks in bonus bets. If your first $5 bet wins, that's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines, or you can even pick who's going to win it all. My final four, if I can remember, it's Creighton, North Carolina, San Diego State and Houston. I got Houston beating San Diego State in the final. So, hey, if you want to follow those picks, I would love to hear that you won because that would also mean that I won. So, again, 200 bucks to use on whatever you want to use for fantasy, uh, daily fantasy sports, a fan duel, college basketball. You can do that here. Uh, tournament's coming up uh, with the Sweet 16 here this weekend. So, it's going to be done here pretty fast. We're going to be into all kinds of other stuff for spring sports. So, again, Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn, and you can bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. I think I'm more likely to cut down the Knicks, but honestly, that's uh, hey neither here nor there. Number four, I think this is my favorite one. Um, ownership will approve a large payroll expenditure before the trade deadline, and the Twins will add two big names in July. Now, before you justify this, I do want to say this. I think there's some wisdom in this from the team standpoint too, where you don't push all your chips into the middle of the table for the division without knowing what your needs are as the season goes on. And so if you get to a point in July and you need a starter or two, and you're looking at it right now, you're going to know more in July than you know now. If you're going to fire your salvo, if you're going to use your pieces to get something, you should probably have a pretty good idea of what you need to get where you want to go at the end of the season. So maybe there is some wisdom in not doing it right now. I think that is at least the, the rationalization that they're using that, uh, you know, yeah, it may not be true, but absolves them from responsibility. But here's the thing about why, and you know, why you're onto something here with this, my fourth bold uh, prediction. Um, going back to the first thing about the team winning 98 games, if the twins get off to a good start and are, are, are a good team globally, not just running away with the AL central. Cause if they have like a comfortable lead in the AL central, but they're still kind of, you know, just pretty good. Uh, among, last, year, last year, basically. Yeah. If, if last year happens again, I don't know if they're as likely to ownership is likely to approve, you know, going out and getting another pitcher or if they need uh, another bat or you know, two pitchers or whatever it is in the end, I kind of thought it was going to be a, or think it's going to be a hitter and a pitcher. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if the twins look like a team that maybe could win the world series, if they had just a little more help, I think that is the thing that will push ownership to relent and spend some money. Uh, and, and maybe hopefully we'll also be a, a half season closer to Rob Manfred's dream of a, uh, you know, 15 digital, oops, I hit my microphone, digital teams, you know, coming together for, and, and the local TV situation, the, the picture is a little more clear for the future. I think if, if the, the twins are playing well, uh, we're, we're closer to a solution, a long-term solution on uh, local uh, TV slash digital money, they're going to be in position to um, add these pieces at the deadline that will, give the, the Twins a better chance to win the World Series, not just limp or whatever to 
an AL Central title. Big time uh, possibilities here in, in the Twin Cities in 2024. I think it's helpful, too, that both the teams that I would consider juggernauts this year are in the NL. So the Twins do have a little easier path to the World Series. It's not easy. You know, it's it's never easy, but an easier. There's path. no Dodgers. There's no Braves going, oh, well, I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can beat these guys. Uh, there, there's nobody in the AL East that makes me think, ah, the Twins can't beat them. Uh, the Central, we think the Twins are the best team. And, uh, you know, the Rangers and the uh, and the Astros in the West and maybe Seattle, too. We're not Astros. talking about teams that are just so much advanced of, yep. uh, of the Twins. So it, going back to what we said earlier uh, in the year uh, shows that we did about um, are people still sleeping on the Twins? This gets back to that. It's they're not sleeping on them in terms of. You know, can they maybe win the NL Central, uh, AL Central? If they won the NL Central, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, but they're sleeping on them in terms of being competitive for the World Series. Absolutely. And uh, I think they absolutely can be. And it's going to be all the more hilarious when the Brewers win the NL pennant. Hmm. That's baseball just has a really good. Well, that would be good for Bob Euchre, I guess. Yep. I agree. Let them win the World Series and then he can ride off into the sunset with his Belvedere cash. Number five, Target Field will surpass three million. In attendance for the first time since the stadium, uh, stadium second year. And that team was horrible. Ninety nine losses, but still had that new stadium smell. I like this one, Dave. I think it's probably the most far fetched one. I'm I was looking at attendance not only for the Twins, but it's just kind of um, it's not uh, jumping across the league very much. And um, you know, when the Twins were were very good a few years ago, 2019, I think they got up to. 2.7 or whatever. But if this, again, this goes back to, they get off to a good start. If they look fabulously entertaining, which I think players like Royce Lewis and Byron Buxton and Carlos Correa and Pablo Lopez are, etc., cetera, uh, people are going to want to see these guys. And yeah. if they're great, if they're playing with the big boys, which I think they can, if they would stop getting these uh, annoying bullpen injuries, they're going to, people are going to want to go to these games. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's probably, this is probably the longest shot of all, but I think they could do 3 million. They've done it before. Well, I, I like all five of those. We'll have mine on our next episode. Let's take a quick transition to Shohei Otani, who met with media today, did not take any questions, but did prepare or have a prepared statement. Also too, I don't know if you saw, but Jonte Porter, NBA player was under coming under fire for some questionable things as far as some unders hitting in a game that he left. So it's not just MLB and it probably is a little more involved on the NBA side, but did anything that happened today help assuage your thoughts or what, what was your takeaway from the statement? Well, as far as Jante goes, you don't want to have questionable unders because that's no. where it all begins. Mom always said, make sure you have them on that are clean in case you get into a car accident. So if you haven't had a chance to watch the Otani it wasn't a press conference. It was just more of a statement um, that was translated. Uh, not by Ipe. Uh, they no. finally stopped giving Ipe things to do. They yeah. were giving – part of the problem here, I think, is that they've given they, – they were giving Ipe things to do even after it came out that he was gambling with Shohei's money. Not a good idea. And, yeah, and that's where a lot of the confusion came from. It, it The thing the, – the revelation or whatever – from today was, you know, Otani really going forward with the, no, he just stole from me. And that stuff about me paying off. Um, he didn't come out and actually say that Ipe made that up about how Otani uh, paid him back, pay, you know, paid his gambling debts, but he kind of said it. And that was, again, as it turns out, Ipe manipulating the, the translating and the communicating between uh, Otani and his agents and, um, you know, Andrew Friedman even stepped up in a, in a team meeting in the team meeting where Ipe was discussing this and said, Shohei paid off the debts. And as, as it turns out, apparently that was Ipe poisoning the well. Um, so it, it, if, if that part is to be believed, then Shohei is mostly exonerated here. Um, you know, he, he didn't, it's, it's something that he claims that he didn't know about until very recently, until we all found out. Um, 
as hard to believe as maybe that is for someone like Shohei, who's got tunnel vision about, you know, playing baseball and not being from the United States, from the West, um, trusting his friend to, you know, not only translate for him, but to handle a lot of his affairs, apparently, with uh, as far as money and accounts and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I, I came into this wanting to believe that Shohei was more or less innocent. Maybe innocent isn't the, the you know, not guilty of betting on baseball for sure. And I think I'm still going that way. It's there, there's still some things that maybe need to be explained even more. And he didn't take questions, which I understand, I guess, because it's uh, legal matters. He was cleared to say whatever he was by his lawyers. Um, but, you know, he's, he's gotten some bad advice show. He has from the start from his agent and some of his other handlers. And it appears that he was betrayed by uh, Ipe. And um, it's uh, it's kind of sad. And uh, I don't know how, you know, he's going to trust anybody anymore after this, but we'll see what happens. So I, as much of a nutshell as I can put it in, that's kind of how I feel. Yeah, it's incredible that four million bucks like that could just be not accounted for or not missed. So, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of wild. Um, quick unrelated note, Brian Wu will start the season on the injured list with elbow inflammation. That was your guy if the Twins had traded for a pitcher from the Mariners. So See, now look, they they didn't – they should have got – instead of DeSclafani and the the, uh, the ragamuffins, uh, you know, Gabriel, they, they should have traded for Wu. Oh, Wu's hurt oh. too. Yep. The Twins can do no right. I'm yep. sorry. Well, if you read Twins Twitter, that's exactly what you'd hear. Well, hey, that's all we have time for. You and I got a ski daddle, ski doodle, because we have an auto new fan draft, fan graphs draft, fantasy draft to get to. I'll quit stumbling over my words and send you all on to your evening. Thanks for listening to Locked on Twins, and we'll see you tomorrow night.